What's up, guys? A little while back, I did a video on gain staging in your mixing process so that you can hit a particular target level. We used a DAW template, and I walked you through how I manage gain in my mixing process and manage headroom throughout the whole mix. I've dropped links for those right below the video in the description. The tutorial spurred on a lot of really lively conversation in the comments with some strong opinions around where you should be setting your levels and if you need headroom. So what I wanted to do today is do a follow-up video where we go more in depth into a couple of the big topics around headroom and digital mixing and modern DAWs. In particular, we're gonna cover four big questions. And my goal for you guys is that you really deeply understand the technology that you guys are using so that you're better able to get really clean and really professional sounding mixes. Question number one is, do you really need six decibels of headroom when you're exporting a track for mastering? Why or why not? Question number two is, when you're mixing and on your audio tracks and your buses and your master, you have third-party audio plugins, do you need to worry about hot signals that are at or close to zero dB or over? Will that cause problems for you? Question number three is, given that all modern DAWs are running 32-bit floating point audio, is headroom even an issue or can you just ignore it completely? And finally, we're going to wrap up with a little discussion around clipping itself. Is it always bad? Is it something you need to avoid at all costs? Sweet. There's our game plan. Let's get into it. Auxiliary fusion. <laughs> Question number one is, do you actually need six decibels of headroom on a pre-master? This is a confusing topic because you have respected and credible authorities that are saying pretty much completely opposite things. On one hand, you have Justin Perkins here on the Pro Audio Files saying that leaving 6 dB of headroom is a myth. Then you have other people in the industry, such as Lander's Mastering Service, saying keep an eye on your master fader and to aim for around negative 6 dBFS because it's quote-unquote nice and safe. And again, we have Tom Frampton, a respected audio engineer and the developer of the well-known plugins Levels and Reference, saying to also peak at roughly negative 6 dB. So how do we make sense of this given that experts in the field don't seem to agree? Let's first look at where the negative 6 dB guideline came from in the first place. It's most likely due to the fact that analog equipment that used to be used to record mixes or process them in mastering typically has a sweet spot where the input signal sounds the best. If it's too low, you have a noise floor to worry about. And if the signal's too high, then you can get distortion or other unwanted effects. So that's where this came from. But given that most electronic musicians, or even just musicians in general that are using DAWs, are producing and mixing in the box entirely with digital audio, the question is, does this still apply? The short answer here is no, but sometimes yes. So you need to understand the whole story here. Let me explain. As long as your mix doesn't clip by exceeding zero dB, a mastering engineer can work with it. Your mix could be at negative one dB, it could be at negative 0.1 dB, and the mastering engineer can just turn it down if they want without having any negative effects. But if at any point your mix goes over zero dB, you're gonna have a clip that a mastering engineer just can't do anything about. At that point, it's pretty much unfixable unless you use some type of uh, voodoo declip tool like Isotope RX. Now, this is assuming you're rendering to 24-bit fixed-point audio. Another aspect of this topic is how 32-bit floating-point audio also applies to this question. So hang tight, because I'm going to speak to that in just a sec. Okay, so if negative 6 dB doesn't matter for digital audio, then how come myself and some other people in the industry are still saying to aim for this as a level? Well, the reason is because even if you're mixing and mastering entirely digitally and totally in a 32-bit floating-point DAW, Tons of fantastic plugins are modeled after analog gear. They're intentionally coded to have the exact same sweet spot as the original equipment. So if you slam a signal above negative six into a particular plugin that's modeled after an analog piece of gear, you can still get unwanted distortion, even in the digital world and even at 32-bit floating point audio. If you're using plugins from companies like Waves or Universal Audio, they'll all say in the manual what their recommended input levels are. If you know you'll never want to use analog modeled plugins, then forget about it. Don't worry about negative 6 dB. But if, like me and thousands of other producers, you really rely on these plugins as essential tools, then why not just aim for negative 6 dB? There's no downside, not at all. 
If you use a template like the free one I've given you linked below in this video, there's no extra work, no extra time spent. You're all set up right from the beginning with correct gain staging. Another reason I still recommend peaking at negative six is if you're not sending your track out to get mastered because you're doing your own mastering. When I master, I typically put analog modeled plugins on my master bus. If the levels coming into those plugins aren't gain staged correctly, then I may get unintended distortion. But even if you are sending your track out to get masters, it's still a good idea to do kind of a reference test mastering chain to see how your mix is going to change in the mastering process. A lot of times when you add mastering plugins like limiters and things like that onto your mix, you'll hear things jump out that you didn't hear before they were applied. So that's a really key part of my process as a mix engineer is applying a test mastering chain to illuminate any issues in the mix that I want to go back and fix. So aiming for negative 6 dB gives you the benefit of being able to use any plugin you want without worrying about it on your master, whether you're mastering your own music or whether you are just doing a test master. So speaking of plugins, let's carry on to our next question. Question number two, can audio plugins on your tracks, buses, or your master safely handle signals above zero dB without causing problems? The short answer, some can and some can't. So you need to understand the details to make informed choices as a producer. This is what Waves has to say about their plugins. They say that some of their plugins can handle very hot input signals, not over zero dB, notice, and others like to have a sweet spot that is much lower. So they're saying that this varies from plugin to plugin and you need to read the manual. So do you want to have to read the manual and know every single one of your plugins word for word by reading that PDF? Or might it just be a little bit easier on yourself if you are going to be using third party plugins to gain stage correctly for the lowest common denominator? In general, native audio effects in your DAW can totally handle signals over 0 dB because they're using 32 bit floating point audio and that has the extra headroom as a buffer for this. They usually won't create unwanted effects when they're pushed. So let's look at an example. A good way to test this is to put a gain stage up before an audio effect. Let's take a chorus device in live here. And then you do an identical gain stage in the opposite direction after the effect. Then we can easily hear if it's causing issues. Here's the original dry signal for reference. And now here's the signal with the chorus effect engaged. It sounds fine, right? Same thing with the EQ8. And with the compressor. Check it out. But now let's take a third party plugin. Next up, we've got Camel Crusher from Camel Fat. I've turned all the modules off, so we're not getting distortion from them. Next up, let's try Trash 2 by Isotope. No audible distortion there. And let's give Isotope Ozone 7 a shot with none of the modules active. But then as soon as you add in an analog model defect, like vintage tape, you get color.
I want to hint at our final question here and say that this isn't necessarily bad. Many of these plugins are designed to create pleasing saturation and distortion in this way, so it's actually intentional on the part of the plugin developer. As a producer, you may want to add the color these plugins can provide as an aesthetic choice. If you want to do that, it's ideal to either add a gain stage before and after, like I'm doing, or to use plugins like these ones from Isotope that have separate input and output gain stages built right in. A lot of plugins add gain, such as when you're adding an EQ boost or when you're adding saturation or distortion within a plugin like Trash. So as a general guideline, you want to trim the outputs to be the same as the inputs, so you keep a consistent level throughout your whole chain of effects. The key point I want to make here is that when you're not gain staging your mix properly, you may unknowingly and unintentionally be pushing some of these plugins and adding unwanted distortion to your track. You heard for yourself the wide variety of different color and tones coming out of the plugins. Some of them probably sounded good to you, others not so good. So if you're gain staging correctly, you'll only get the desired color when you actually want it. If your master level is near or over 0 dB, then you could be getting levels on your individual tracks and buses that are overloading plugins exactly like this. That's just another reason I still recommend leaving a bit of headroom on your master. Okay, let's get to our third question. Question number three is, seeing as modern DAWs are using 32-bit floating point processing, does it even matter if you clip your master? The answer, no, but only in certain circumstances. Let's take a look at an example. We'll take a mix and we'll push it so that it's clipping the master. That's obviously causing issues. You never want to send a clipped signal to your digital to analog converter. But let's try rendering this out to audio. We'll go to the audio export menu and we'll pick the 32-bit option. When we take that file and load it back into the DAW, we can see and hear that it's horribly distorted. But this is where 32-bit audio comes in because it has the extra headroom to allow for overages. If we go inside the audio clip and turn down the clip gain, we can see that the transients are still there and they're not clipped off. This is what a mastering engineer would do if you sent them this file. So in this case, 32-bit audio is pretty sweet. But let's take a look at the same export rendered to 24-bit. You can still turn it down, but there's a distinct difference. You can see the transients are still all sheared off and there's nothing you can do about it. So if this is the case and you can just render your mix to a 32-bit floating point file, then why worry about headroom at all? Well, let me give you two reasons. One, as I said earlier, if you wanted to create a test master or put any analog modeled plugins on the mix, the levels would be so high in this case that they'd likely be creating horrible sounding or at least unintended distortion. Two, personally, I think it's sloppy. If you send a mix down like this to a mastering engineer, you're just going to look like an amateur. Whether you're a mix engineer yourself or a producer who's mixing their own music, your job is to get the levels balanced and summing up correctly. That's my opinion, so take it or leave it, but I would personally feel pretty embarrassed if I needed to ask a mastering engineer to turn down my mix so it doesn't clip. So why not just do it right from the beginning? There's no downside to leaving a little bit of headroom as a buffer. Okay, and last but not least, let's soldier on to question number four. Question number four. Is clipping really that bad? And do you need to avoid it at all costs? My answer, not all clipping is bad. As you've heard in the examples with the plugins, it could add some pleasing color to your sound, actually some desirable stuff. It wasn't uncommon for producers and mix engineers to push analog gear in this way to get some desirable characteristics. That's why so many current plugins are analog modeled. That said, I'd be really careful about which plugins you do this with and how hard you push them. If you are going to try this, I have three suggestions for you. One, 
extensively test out your plugins and demo different ones so you can figure out which one of them will create clipping effects that you like. As you heard, there's a huge variety in the tone and behavior in this realm, so make sure you're making the right aesthetic choice for your song. Two, try it on individual tracks or buses before you use it on the whole master. You may find that certain sounds like drums or your bass line benefit from it, but others don't. Or if you are gonna try it on your whole mix, do it in parallel. Mix it in rather than running it as an insert. So you could try just adding in a bit of that analog clipping or clipping flavor to see if it benefits your song. Number three, give your ears a rest before finalizing a mix or master with clipping effects. It's really easy to get ahead of yourself and caught up in the moment and push things a little too hard. We've all been guilty of this. You can get addicted to that sizzle that intentional clipping can provide and it can be fatiguing and over the top. So as always with any mix, give yourself a break come back with fresh ears, listen to some reference songs, get yourself reoriented, and then make your final determination if it's something that you actually want to include. I hope this has helped to peel back some of the layers in the topic of headroom in digital mixing. Using good practices for gain staging is one of the keys to getting a clean and professional sounding mix for sure. I've created an extensive DAW template for Ableton Live with all of these best practices already set up and routed and baked in. I wanted to offer this to you guys as a free download because by using this template, you can set yourself up for success knowing that at the time you start your project, everything's already dialed. Just click the link below the video if you guys wanna grab it and it's yours. Thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe if you're not already and I'll catch you guys real soon. Cheers. Fuck, fuck it.